These were our parents and grandparents, our own aunts and uncles. In their world, the America of the 1930s, something went desperately wrong, like a bad dream, a punishment, or a plague. I felt that we weren't going to make it. Certainly that I wasn't going to make it. I was convinced that I was going to die one night. They had nowhere to turn but to their families, their friends, and the kindness of strangers. They had no idea when it would end, how it would end, or even if it would end. We eat a lot of beans now. <laughs> a lot of people eat a lot of beans in the Depression. They saw grinding poverty and fabulous wealth side by side. Great armies of migrants on the move with nowhere to go. We were different. Uh, we were poor. We were dependent on people for help. And uh, a lot of the people in the, in the businesses called us filthy scum, dirty, rotten, stinking okies, and all that. Dirt farmers, maids, and titans of industry. In America's fields and factories, they fought terrible battles against each other. And in their fury, they must have asked themselves if democracy itself could survive. I don't think it. I know damn well they would have been a revolution in America if Roosevelt had not got elected. And I'd have been damn part of that revolution. They chose a rich man, a landed aristocrat disabled by polio, to help them redeem America. And you felt that this guy came and he was going to save the people. And a tremendous feeling for him. Holy hell, the people could kiss his, his toenails. That's how much they loved this guy. He saved capitalism. Whether this is a good thing or not, I'm not about to betray my sentiments, but he saved it. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear itself. Somehow, in the hardest of hard times, with America slipping away, our parents and grandparents found the courage to fight their way out. They clung to the hope that they could save America. That hope drove them to acts of heroism, drove them to take hold of their own destiny, to come together and make their nation work for them. Nothing turned out quite the way they planned. What began in the Roaring Twenties ended when war exploded in the Forties. They may have done an imperfect job. Some lost their nerve, and some gave their lives. But by the time the Great Depression was over, they had done better than simply save America. They had made a new America. And these are their stories. been voted the greatest man in history after Napoleon Bonaparte and Jesus Christ. Perhaps Americans saw in him what they liked best in themselves in 1927. A millionaire Huck Finn, a shy, awkward farm boy turned automaker who hated laziness and disorder, labor unions, and Wall Street bankers. A prankster. He was the living symbol of power, prosperity, 
and America's faith in every man for himself. In that time before the Great Depression, when captains of industry mattered more than presidents. Back in 1914, Ford had revolutionized assembly line production, and to keep his workers from quitting, he announced he would raise their pay to a generous $5 a day, twice what they earned before, and twice what they could earn at any other auto company. It was a simple American bargain, security and high wages in exchange for hard work. The legend of Henry Ford, of course, was greatly embellished by his offer of five dollars a day, and the word of that penetrated the most remote mountain village in West Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee, and uh, well, the Ruther brothers heard about the five dollars a day in Wheeling, too, and I can tell you, it, it uh, looked mighty good. They came to Detroit in hopes of a life they could find nowhere else. Ford workers enjoyed company picnics, could live in company housing, and even buy the Ford cars they produced. High wages paid off in high production and high profits for the company. My family moved to Detroit 1927 from Columbus, Ohio. I didn't like Detroit when I first moved. In fact, I ran away three times and went back to Columbus, Ohio. But uh, my daddy finally convinced me the third time that I had to stay. And uh, Detroit at that time was a booming town. Business was booming, cars were being bought, and you had the big bands, you had the dance hall. Everything was going great. My father and uncle arrived in Detroit in 1926 from Mexico via Kansas City in a Model T. People came from Guanajuato, San Luis Potosí, of course Mexico City. And in our neighborhood, I know of no kid that I associate with where their parents were born in America. Nobody. We had the um, Poles, we had the Lithuanians, we had Finnish, we had Scotch, we had Italian. In great waves of migration from Europe and the American South, the hopeful had found their way to Detroit's thriving ethnic neighborhoods. They had been Ukrainian peasants and Alabama sharecroppers. Now they were auto workers, 50,000 strong at Ford's River Rouge factory, the largest industrial complex in history. Here was a strange new world, thundering forges, the huge foundry and powerhouse, the endless miles of assembly lines. They called it the Cathedral of Industry, and here, like clockwork, they made four cars every minute, 240 an hour, 6,000 Fords a day. The heart of American industry was Detroit, and the heart of Detroit was Henry Ford's Rouge. My father really cherished his job at Ford's. He was one of few, uh, clearly, of blacks in, uh, in Detroit who had uh, a supervisory job and, and plants. And Ford's was a kind of premier plant as far as blacks were concerned. At Ford, I don't know if anyone has told you, you had a little uh, sort of brass badge about this big and this wide. And he used to wear it on a blue serge, serge suits on Sunday or lapel. And they were proud of the fact that they worked for Ford. This badge was a badge of distinction. It might even get you a deaconship in a church. It might, might even get you a beautiful lady. It was a kind of a pass key uh, to, you know, the good things in life in the community. I mean, you were invited to this or that. You were almost a kind of a celebrity set. My mother did day work. She'd go like to your house today and his house tomorrow and his house the next day. And uh, she did day work, washing and ironing. And then I got this job at Ford's and I had never seen quite so much money. I was just, I